Hello, Kat Solois, Director of Research at the McGregor Company. McGregor's is a family-owned, independent egg retailer with more than 70 years experience in the crop input space. We have 35 brick and mortars employing more than 350 people across Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, and Northeast Oregon. In this video, I'm gonna present yield data on wireworm control and how it affects winter wheat. How with the introduction of BASF's Taraxa into the cereal space, we now have an option that actually controls wireworm in our winter wheat rotation. In 2019, I was called to look at a field near La Crosse, Washington. This is a 14 to 16 inch rainfall environment that was really struggling to control Downy Brome and his crop. The field in question is a pretty interesting situation where 40 acres is under pivot and the remainder of the 150, 160 acres is farmed in dry land. In this particular field, the irrigated component had previous history of alfalfa and Timothy hay because the grower used it to supply his cattle with forage. But he took it out of production in 2016. In 2017, 18, and 19, what the grower noticed is that the area underneath the pivot was 70% below the dry land component as far as yield goes. That grower had also noticed that downy brome was becoming a bigger and bigger problem. So in the fall of 2018, he applied 3.25 ounces of Zidua post-plant pre-emergent of good timing to this crop to get a handle of the downy brome in this field. However, he was not happy with his control and that's when I got called out to the field. What he thought was herbicide damage ended up being a root cause of wireworm. And as many good researchers often do, I did not have a solution for him that day, but I said, why don't we investigate this problem together? How about you let me put a research plot on this ground? And he's been more than gracious, allowing us to do amazing wireworm work in 2019, 20, and 21. So in fall of 2019, we instituted our very first year of planting underneath this pivot, winter wheat and winter peas, and then in the spring, we followed up with spring wheat. The goal in this trial location was to really be able to compare the seed applied insecticides, but we included that winter pea so that we could use a product called Capture LFR, which is bifenthrin. This product can be applied in furrow and surface incorporated. Previous work by the McGregor Company has really shown that the surface incorporated bifenthrin is one of the few options we have that actually has mortality behavior to those wireworms. Bifenthrin is a labeled product in our pulse crops and canola, but will never be labeled in our cereal crops. Our plan with this particular plot was to use the irrigation to establish the crop and then to be able to call the wireworm back to the surface to ensure that we got really good pressure. And guess what? We got the job done. So let's take a look at this drone image that was taken the middle of May. This one was taken right at 50 days post-emergent. The thing I want you to notice is that the untreated checks, that bare earth area, they stick out. This image was taken 70 days post-emergent. The thing that's really interesting about these drone images is the wireworm damage comes on quick and it comes on complete. We can also look at the sub-blocking effect of this experiment. So I have the different seed applied insecticides sub-blocked together. Let's draw some boxes around those. So this first box is actually Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a proprietary product from McGregor's that combines nitrogen, phosphorus, and zinc, and it's meant to be applied in furrow. The reason I wanted to show you this is wireworm management needs to be thought of as an integrated approach. What other cultural practices do you have besides just hard chemistry? Well, this is a good example of one. The faster we can get that crop to germinate and the deeper we can get those roots to dive is a cultural practice we can use to help that crop outrun the pest. In this scenario, the yield effect between our Kickstarter and our non-Kickstarter treatments was more than 25 bushels. I should also point out that the seed treatment was exactly the same. No insecticide was applied on either side. So the first set of boxes is imidacloprid or cruiser. The second set is looking at Lumavia. And then take a look at the Taraxa block. I think it's very visual and easy to see that Taraxa was one of the only options that offered season long control of wireworm all the way through to yield. So let's take a look at that yield data. The thing that's interesting about this yield data is how it groups. So our untreated check was around 15 bushels. 
are single mode of action type products, so just Cruiser or just imidacloprid, we gained another 15 bushels. When we looked at something like Lumavia, it was a statistical improvement, but it still didn't offer acceptable control all the way through the season. And Taraxa offered a statistically significant improvement in yield across all treatments. I do need to point out this was spring wheat and this was 2020. Let's look at the winter wheat data of 2020. So in winter wheat, we planted in the third week of September. We had ideal emergent conditions and we used a starter fertilizer, which meant that that crop had plenty of time to tiller and looked outstanding going into spring. Visually, we could always point out those untreated checks, but we couldn't really parse apart any details between the treatments within that winter wheat stand. So when we look at the yield data, it's pretty interesting to me that those treatments tend to group the same that they did in spring wheat, but that yield difference is substantially less. So our untreated check is around 112 bushels. We see our single mode of action products non-statistically different than our untreated check. When we start stacking multiple modes of action, we can get a statistical difference. And Taraxa offered season long control, even in our winter wheat, that was a substantial 10 to 15 bushel improvement over our untreated check. So when we think about 2020 growing season, remember we had those ideal grain fill conditions, which means that tillers weren't a limiting factor in a majority of the yield. So we really wanted to retool for 2021 and see if we could get tillers to be that limiting factor. This is what that trial site looks like in 2021. The adjustments that we made, we took the seeding rate population from 1 million to 800,000. We pushed the planting date back by three weeks into the last part of October, and we did not run a starter fertilizer in this trial. Our goal was to ensure that tillers would be our limiting factor. Again, we used winter wheat, spring wheat, and this time we used spring lentils. This is an image of what the wireworm damage started to look like the beginning of April. The thing that was really interesting is we saw absolutely no damage in the fall and all the way through spring greenup. But as soon as those soil temperatures began to rise, bam, there was that pressure. This is the same plot taken about 30 days afterwards. So we see no insecticide on the far right-hand side, just a neonic alone in the center, and Taraxa is on the left-hand side. You can see really in this winter wheat plot, it is the only one that's providing any level of control all the way six months after planting. Let's look at the aerial drone image. Here's our Kickstarter treatments, with and without, they're striped up and down that field, with and without Kickstarter. None of it has seed applied insecticide. Let's draw boxes around the Cruiser treatments, our Lumavia treatments, and there is Taraxa again. If we fade out those other treatments, I think, again, it's visually very easy to see that Taraxa is the only treatment that is allowing any level of protection all the way through that growing season. We also use Taraxa as a check embedded into other blocks of seed applied insecticide, and those are the only areas that have an acceptable stand throughout this plot. When we look at the data, this data looks a whole lot more like spring wheat data, as in very big statistical differences just in our winter wheat crop. So when you look at the non-treated check, that non-treated check is around 25 bushels. I should point out that our single modes of action, so the 1.33 ounces of Cruiser, 1.33 ounces of Cruiser Plus, 2.4 of Resonate, that is the most neonic you can put on a seed and that offers two modes of action and it was non-statistically different than our untreated check. We had to move to something like Lumavia to see a statistical difference. And then when we used a product like Taraxa, we went from a 25 bushel to a 70 bushel crop the only product that was lasting all the way through fall into spring, and this was held all the way into May and June of that next season. This next graphic 
isn't the prettiest, but I think it does a really good job of explaining how impactful just a little area can be across an entire field average. I've gotten the question quite a few times that bifenthrin is a product that you can prescribe across an acre, meaning you could treat just specific acres that have your wireworm problem. We don't really get that ability with seed treatments. So what I did here is I was able to use the production zones that the grower gave from the field in La Crosse, and that's listed at the bottom of the graphic. So that wireworm flat is listed at five acres. The entire flat is 40 acres. His low producing ground is 45 acres. His middle producing ground is that 80 acres, and the high producing ground is 35. What we did here is we also then put the yield estimates for each one of those zones. If you look at the green area, if we had no damage whatsoever, this 200 acre field would yield 100 bushels. If that wireworm flat, just that five acres, had a 75% reduction in yield, which we documented in our trial work, the entire 200 acres comes down to an average of 97 bushels. That means across the entire 200 acres, three bushels was lost. So does it economically pay to treat the entire acre with Taraxa when just five acres is affected? You can do the math, but I believe that this information definitely points to it's an economically viable solution. So wrapping up, what are the true costs of wireworm? Does it pay to control this pest on a small acreage? When you look at some of the math and the yield responses that we've gotten in winter wheat, I believe that answer is yes. If this video has sparked any questions, curiosities, comments, concerns, please feel free to reach out. My name's Kat Slois. Thanks for watching.